So uh, let's start back with a session which is uh, about several other issues. First of all, but uh, let me thank you, Renzo Pegoraro, Carlo Casonato, Ralph, and all the persons that contributed to this conference. Because one of the things that I feel is that I always feel out of my comfort zone in this conference, which is good, <laughs> which is exactly what we should do all the times. So trying to speak with other people from other disciplines is really missing today. And so thank you for that. <laughs> That's good. So it's, it's not really a conference on ethics. It's a conference and much more than this. Yeah. This is very interesting. So having said that, uh, we have two interesting lectures uh, of, on two issues that we all find all the way uh, when we are in, engaged in research or other activities. And again, there's a strict relationship with research, uh, bioengineering, and ethics. And the two issues are regulation, <laughs> and communication. So it's my pleasure uh, to introduce Professor Federico de Montalvo. Uh, Federico, we crossed our uh, roads several times and we met uh, before, but actually he uh, has uh, several roles in the uh, Pontifical University of Comillas and uh, he participates in several uh, bioethical activities. He's professor, professor of constitutional law. Uh, he participated in a committee, in the Spanish Committee of Bioethics, and a, a long list of several uh, other uh, activities. So we hope that uh, Federico will help us address one of the big issues of uh, performing bioethical, well, engineering of life, which is addressing the uh, regulatory issues that sometimes prevent our activities. We, we were discussing that we speak a lot of times and a lot, uh, we spend a lot of time uh, discussing with the legal office and the data protection officer. And I hope he will give us some uh, useful uh, insights for uh, dealing this, with this and addressing these issues. Federico. Okay, thank you very much, Alberto. It's a real pleasure for me to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. Last time I was here was two years and a half ago, at the very end of February 2020, I still remember in the Piazza di Spagna with only two Spanish people. We are talking about Saturday at nine o'clock in the, in the night. Two people, my wife and I, nobody were there. After being in a great conference about uh, the good algorithm, el bueno algoritmo, I, rem I, I uh, was diagnosed by COVID. Uh, to uh, one week, uh, one week later, I was guilty of closing my uh, university. Only the Second Republic of Spain had been able to do it. So at that time, I thought I am going to be fired. My only hope was perhaps this uh, virus from the Vatican. So it's a strain to fire someone with a virus from the Vatican. And later, I was appointed vice rector and general secretary of my university. So perhaps this is my punishment. Instead of firing me, I am now the vice rector, so I need to, to be every time, every hour, solving, signing, doing a lot of things for, but in any case, I am very happy because I am working in one of the most interesting and smart places, which is my university, Madrid University of the Jesuits. I am going, sorry about the joke, but I am going to talk about not a very exciting topic. Topic is exciting, but uh, from a legal perspective, but from the perspective of regulation. Uh, I am not talking about, uh, I am not going to talk about human rights, ethical principles. I am going to talk about how we should address this problem. So I am going to put the mouse, the organoid, or the stem cell in the box of law which is not, as I said, very exciting. I will try to, to answer this is, uh, to answer some questions. Is law enough uh, prepared to address the issues coming from the development of biotechnology? Does law have enough instruments, uh, regulatory instruments, to address such uh, issues? Is civil law? I am comparing civil law and common law is civil law because in Italy, in Spain, in France, in many countries of Europe, we are based on civil law, not in common law. I am going to say at the end that I think that common law is 
better prepared for all these issues than, for example, civil law, which is the French model. The English model is better prepared than I. Uh, as Alberto said, uh, I, was, I have been working for the Spanish Bioethics Committee for nine years. I finished my, uh, my term uh, before, uh, before this uh, summer. Uh, during these nine years, we, uh, we didn't prepare a specific report about gene uh, editing. We, we prepared a report about prenatal genetic counseling that I think is an interesting report. We prepared a statement about the case in China, Lulu and Nana case about CRISPR-Cas9. But we why? But consider that we, uh, for these uh, nine years, we prepared almost 30 uh, documents, almost 30 reports, half of them during the pandemic. Why? Because I think that the pandemic took all our time. We had at the same time in Spain pandemic, like in Italy, it was incredible. The wave of the pandemic in Spain was like in Italy, incredible. With a lot of, as Monse said before, with a lot of too much topic for one brain, because I am used to try to address one uh, biological topic, one per month, but no one per day was, uh, was amazing. And also because we have in Spain the new law on euthanasia. So the bioethics committee was focused on the pandemic, the ethical issues of the pandemic, and the law on euthanasia. So we didn't prepare. It is to us, Laura Palazzani said before that at UNESCO, I was a member of the ABC for eight years, where I met some extraordinary people, such as uh, Laura. I, we, we, were, we work a lot in this topic. We prepare a report on uh, geno human genome. We prepare a report about future generations. So it was one of the main topics. So my, my main experience about this topic was related to, to uh, UNESCO. Also, I have been working for, for Andorra. It's a small state, interesting state with two heads of the state. One is the, let's say the leader of the secular world, the president of France, and the other is the bishop of Seudurgel, which is quite, it's quite interesting to have this such a different uh, head of the state. And there I have prepared the new law on biomedicine when, where, I, uh, where, where I try to develop some of the ideas that I am going to present uh, today. Okay, so these are the questions. Also, one week before the pandemic, one week before coming to the, this conference of the Vatican in February 2020, I wrote, it was one year before, almost, no, half a year before the pandemic, I wrote a book with this title, Bioconstitutionalism. I, I, I was not trying to support the ideas of Michel Foucault, I used some ideas. And it's interesting that six months before the pandemic, I was talking about bioconstitutionalism when biopolitics was, has been in fashion for this during all the pandemic. In this, in this book, I, uh, I try to address the topic of how should we regulate uh, gene editing, all this, uh, all this improvement of biotechnology. And the most interesting thing about this, that many of the ideas that I wrote there were very useful during the pandemic, because the pandemic has shown us that if, want, if we want to regulate things very uncertainty, like such as the pandemic, such as gene editing, we need to introduce new ideas such as principles in a state of rules. We're used to work with, with rules. Rules means that you, you have a legal prescription which establishes a specific legal consequence. For example, it is forbidden to drive more than 50 kilometers per hour. This is a rule. Uh, a principle is something like you can drive as fast as you are not putting pedestrians in a situation of risk. In the first, with a rule, is very sure the consequence. It's very clear the consequence. When you are talking about principle, you need interpretation and argumentation. And the idea that I am going to support, as we have seen during the pandemic, that we need, we need more principles in a state of rules. We need flexible prescription in a, st in a state of very strict rules, because rules are not useful for this kind of uncertainty. So we need to address our uncertainty through legal uncertainty. This is the paradox, and for me this is the interesting thing. It's the only way. And during the pandemic, remember in Italy, in Spain, many professors were argu arguing about uh, we cannot use compulsory vaccination because there is not a specific rule about compulsory vaccination in our law. We need a specific provision. This is a mistake because we cannot have 
a specific provision, but for something that we cannot foresee. So we need to play with uh, principles in a state of uh, rules. Okay, so this is the law we have. Uh, and to more questions about the topic I am going talking about. Or I'm going to talk about. We are preparing our lawyers, our students, in the right way to address these new issues. Sometimes or many times in our universities, we are preparing our lawyers in the, uh, under the idea of rules. They need to be the best lawyers to apply the rule, and the idea is they need to, to be the best lawyer to interpret the principle, to interpret the law, not to apply, because apply is very difficult. We need interpretation and argumentation, state only apply. Are our judges and courts enough prepared for this? Because if we are talking about principles in a state of rules, we are talking about flexible prescription in a, in a state of a very clear prescription, the role of the position of the court will be very important they, because they will need to interpret the principles at the very end of the day. Are our court prepares? They have enough knowledge about bioethics because we talk about community and bioethical literacy. But we should talk about judges also because at the end they will have the last say, the last voice. Remember during the pandemic, who had the last say, the last voice? Judges, the court. And this is an important topic for Spain, perhaps not for Italy, because in Spain we have the, Spain is the most techno-optimist place in the world. There is an interesting survey uh, comparing different countries in Europe, and there are two very interesting questions about uh, biotechnological improvement. In this survey, they ask uh, many people from Italy, Germany, UK, France, should religious put limits to science? The Spanish people said no even more than uh, French people, it's interesting. Yeah. French is a secular, very secular state from many centuries ago. But when they ask Spanish people about should ethics put limits to science, Spanish say no also. If you compare to Germany, to Italy, we'll see. So if this is because Spanish people, they know, oh, they think that biotechnology is going to be the best challenge, the best thing, or it's because they don't know a lot about bioethics. And I think this is because they don't know a lot about bioethics. So be careful. Also, remember that when we talk about disruption, usually we talk about technology. It is interesting. When we ask someone, which is the most disruptive thing in the current times? Everybody usually say, says, no, it's big data, artificial intelligence, robotics. It's not true. Art. I am not talking about art in the sense that our colleague is going to take art later. I am talking about the acronym. I am talking about human-assisted reproduction technology. When we were able to put the embryo on the table, we were able to do a lot of things. So art has changed. At UNESCO, we said something about this. Art has changed everything in the area of law. For example, we were playing with the same principle for many centuries. Mater semper certa es, and now it's impossible to say who is the mother. Perhaps we know who is the father, but it's very difficult to know who is the mother. Also, we have the problem of savior siblings. We have the problem of uh, motherhood surrogacy, which is a huge problem everywhere. And you may remember that a French professor many centuries ago went to the UK to study the British Parliament and said, Parliament can do everything but make a woman a man and a man a woman. And we can say that art can do anything, even more than the Parliament. Can make a woman a man and a man a woman. So I think art is real, the main disruptor. I am not trying to say it's good or bad. I am trying to say that everything, all the most difficult moral and ethical issues coming from art, even more than big data and artificial intelligence. And everybody's thinking about big data and artificial intelligence. So CRISPR-Cas is one of these disruptors, one of the main disruptors, because we are talking about healing, enhancement, somatic, germ, germline. This case of Lulu and Nana in China. Also, the American Bioethical Commission said the problem now is that we can redesign for the better. It's not only eliminating the bad, selecting the good. We can redesign for the better, and this is the real issue. Is disruption hu hum inhuman? But I used to tell my students, don't worry. Disruption is not bad by itself. 
because we are very disruptive. The main difference between human beings and the animals is that we are extremely disruptive. The animals, they like to accommodate to the context. We like to change. We like to play God because we believe in God. This is the reason. The animals, they don't want to play God because they don't believe in God. So this is the main difference. You have this idea of Luke Ferry. What, human main, uh, what makes human morals being very different from animals is not their nature, the natural characteristic or physical. It's the power to transcend their nature to transform everything. Also, Javier de la Torre, who's a professor of my university, the specific characteristic of humans is confrontation, not adaptation. And can we say humans are the only creatures who reject to be what they are? So I think disruption is not bad. It's something very typical from, uh, of human uh, beings. But the problem is this, uh, uh, Mario Benedetti, I think it's not a real sentence of Mario Benedetti. Mario Benedetti took from someone, but he said, when we thought that we had all the answers, life changed all the questions. We are now in the area of questions because we don't have the real questions. And when we want to find the answers, firstly, we need to prepare the question for the answers. So the question is, does law have not only the answers, but the questions? Is law prepared for everything is coming? I think that, as I said before, the main problem of our legal system, but this is not because Roman law, because in Roman law, they address uncertainty. The Romans knew that they, there are going to be a lot of uncertainty, so they developed the presumptions, for example. The problem was the civil law coming from France. The French model thought everything must be very certain because we don't want to give a lot of power to interpret the law to the court. All the power is in the hands of the parliament, so if we don't want to give a main role to the courts, we need to have a very clear rule. We, have, we need rules instead of principles. So the problem now that we are not in the area, I know, I know, we're in the area of certainty. We are in the area of uncertainty. So in the area of uncertainty, we can play with rules or we need principles. We need flexible prescriptions or we can use very strict, very clear prescriptions as rules are. This is for me one, this is an example, as I say, of rule. The, the principle is more open. You can drive as, uh, as fast as you don't put in a rig to the pedestrians. If you consider it's forbidden to go more than 50 kilometers per hour, it's very clear. Considering security is perfect, but considering justice, sometimes I can drive more than 50 kilometers without any danger for the pedestrian. Sometimes there are a lot of pedestrians. From considering justice, principles are better, considering security, uh, rules are better. But if we are under the era of uncertainty, we can play with rules. This is the question. Remember that during the pandemic, the principles took the main role. We forgot about rules. All the courts started to work with principles, precautionary principles, lockdown based on precautionary principles, not in a rule, because rules were impossible to, to foresee this uh, situation. Also, principle of proportionality. All the courts were asking about proportion. Is this measure proportional or not? So we overcome this pandemic from a legal perspective, no using rules, using principles. Why? Because uncertainty. During uncertain times, we need principles, not rules. So the idea is certainty through principles, to address uncertainty through Uncertainty. This is, for me, the, the interesting paradox. This is Ernesto Vidal, he's a professor of legal philosophy in the uh, Universidad de Valencia, who developed this idea. We, need, we need to take seriously principles. We need to consider that the way bioethics plays is the best. Remember that law usually uses rules and bioethics use principles. So bioethics is solving such a hard, difficult cases using principles, without rules. Principle of autonomy, principle of non-maleficent, principle of beneficent, principle of justice. 
principle of protection against vulnerability, not rules. And it's interesting. So remember this, let's say, in a metaphoric way, struggle between law, the big, strong brother, with the coercion faculty and the soft brother, the weak brother, bioethic, we can say now that the strong brother is bioethic. Why? Because the methodology of bioethics is better for this uncertainty than the methodology of law usually based on rules. So the idea is from law to take the experience of bioethics these last uh, three decades and to use to address this kind of difficult topics. More principles in a state of rules. If we are thinking that we are going to solve this such an uncertain conflict using rules, for me, is a mistake. And it means something very important for our students and for our judges, for our lawyers in the future. The most important function of a lawyer and a judge won't be application, will be interpretation and argumentation. Interpretazione e argumentation. In Spanish, sounds worse than in Italian. Interpretation and argumentation is the most important thing because law, law is not a pure science, a exact science. Law, the power of law is in the hands of argumentation. The important thing is to use or to interpret the principle in the same way. So for example, you have the example of principle of proportionality. You have a principle, but all the courts are always interpreting proportionality in the same way. The conclusions or the result can be different because law is law but principle. So this is the idea. And this is a paradoxical thing also. Because biotechnology, we will have more and more hard, difficult cases. And because of this, we will need humans to solve this conflict using principles. Principles are easy for humans, but not for machines. So when we think we will have a robot in a state of a lawyer in the future, yes, for the easy cases, for the rules. But when we are talking about principles, we need people. So the interesting thing is that in the future, biotechnology, biotechnology and the development of technology will save our work as a lawyer, the interesting thing. Because this kind of difficult issues means that we need principles. And I am going to finish in a second. So the important, I, I want to underline the important role, not only of the principle, the important role of the court. So we need to develop the, the knowledge of the courts about bioethics, about biotechnology. This is very important for the, for the future, not only to have involved people also the court, because the court is going to play. And remember that we have, I am going to finish, remember that we have some interesting principles with some interesting documents. One is principle of proportionality. Well, there is a lot of document about. Also, there is another principle that we need to work a lot about this, is the dual use dilemma. This is also an interesting uh, principle. And remember that all these kind of principles, such as principle of, of precaution, the precautionary principle is related to the idea, it's an Italian idea, of a slow science. A slow science doesn't mean that you are not going to progress. A slow science means discernment, which is very important in the area to be uh, cautious. So, principles, I'm going to finish in one second. And two ideas, one Woody Allen, and the other is uh, Unamuno, two important philosophers. Future is very interesting for me because it's the, it's the place where I will uh, spend the rest of my life. And Unamuno, who is one of the most important philosophers and writers in Spain, we don't have very famous philosophers because we develop our philosophy through novels. This interesting thing of Spain. If you want to read philosophy you, in Spain, you need to read novels, not essay. We prefer metaphors, stories to tell philosophy than uh, tractatus or something. There is uh, Unamuno, who as a philosopher said, scientificism is a disease from which are not even free the scientists. So think about this idea. We, can we regulate? Yes, through principles. Do we have principles? We have principle of proportionality, precautionary principle. We need to work more and more with these kind of principles, and we need to work also with dual use dilemma, which is also an important principle to address. Rules are very interesting, but rules are for easy cases, but we are addressing very hard, difficult cases. 
and it means that we need to think about this when we are teaching our students, because they are going to interpret to, our, to use argumentation instead of mere application of law, which is going to be very difficult in the future, and also to involve our judges in this kind of conferences, because they will have, in this context of flexible prescription, the last say. And for having the last say, you need to have enough knowledge to interpret these kind of uh, principles. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Federico. It was uh, very, very interesting insights. I feel like there will be a lot of questions as soon as we move on. Uh, sorry for being in a hurry, but actually we are running out of time and I have to guarantee that we stay in, uh, in our time slot. Thank you so much also for saving some time. So we have uh, now uh, eight minutes to go for the questions, which is a lot of time. Uh, I would ask the, the people in the room if there's any. Carlo, please. Uh, now the problem of involving, thank you very much for the, your <laughs> presentation. Uh, now involving people, I wonder, I heard about education, information, but I never heard the word listening. <laughs> I think that the first step is not to inform, is not to educate, is not to recuperate the paternalistic approach that medicine uh, just is throwing away, but we have to listen to the questions of the people and to listen to the fear of the people, and to listen to the inequities and the injustice that people see in the um, uh, way uh, science try to answer to the needs, not to the needs of the people around the world. Let's see what is happening with malaria and COVID about vaccines. So I think listening and uh, the fear, the questions, and the real needs of the people is the first step. Otherwise, they are going to refuse information. Thank you. I, Marco, I don't know what you think about that. <laughs> Marco, your reaction to that? Oh, my, my reaction is that I fully agree. I mean, I mean, I didn't... Federico has another question, please. No, it's, no, it's very quickly. It's about this listening. This morning, I, I talked about this at the Etat General de la Biotique in France as a ex post evaluation process of this law this kind of laws. And I think that uh, our colleague from France said, no, but this was not a success as you think. It is true that the second, it was the second Etat General de la Biotique in France. Everybody said that it was better than the first, and perhaps the third will be better than the second. But the good thing about this is that in France, every seven years, you, they are going to think and listening again about these topics. In Spain, for example, we have the more let's say progressive, uh, uh, considering that progressive is a metaphor, is a metaphor, law on human assistant, uh, human as reproduction assisted techniques. From 2000, the last one from 2006, the <coughs> parliament doesn't have the duty, any legal duty to review. So it's there forever. The law in euthanasia, there is not any duty. So we need to understand that uh, our future laws in, uh, on this kind of topics must be reevaluated every five, six years. The way to have everybody involved, because if not, you will have a law, will be there forever, instead of rethinking about the law, because if not, everything will depend on the parliament. And I think that everything must depend on the people. So this idea of the duty of the parliament to review the law for me, it's one of the instruments that I didn't have enough time because the moderator was so strict <laughs> with me. But no, as other moderators, I have the, the, the worst moderator. <laughs> it's a joke. <laughs> but but, the, but I think it's, other, it's another instru important instrument to reevaluate. We, we cannot think that ex ante evaluation is enough. We need uh, evaluation of the law every five, six, seven, because everything is changing so fast. So the only way to have people involved to listen people is through up ex post evaluation legal duty about this kind of laws. So the example of France is not bad. Three fast, very fast questions and fast responses here. One, <laughs> ah, microphone is, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just answer for France. Uh, in order, um, the, the, the law about uh, end of life 
has not been applied so far. What can we do in this case? And so there is no evaluation. We know that one third of the French departments, we have no palliative care. Palliative care is uh, officially in, uh, written in the law and uh, in the requirements, and it is not applied, so it is not so easy. You are lucky. <laughs> <laughs> because in Spain, we are not as lucky as you are because we have the law and it's crazy. The cases are completely crazy. It's like a new circus. And without a real evaluation of the law, this is the problem. We have a law in euthanasia with a, without the duty of evaluating the consequences. But Marco, uh, let, let's do another conference on risk communication because I, I think this is deserved my, very much. I, I'm sorry for any burning question, but actually we are out of time. And please, if you uh, want to continue the discussion, reach out with the uh, speakers and they will be glad to respond. Thank you so much. Thank you.